First, I want to thank the Simon Foundation for inviting me to give this seminar. And indeed, I, I, I think it's a very exciting time for sleep and for autism research. And I hope I will convince you that uh, there's a lot to do. So my, the talk of my lecture uh, will be about phenotyping sleep. Uh, indeed, because uh, sleep is uh, quite a com more complicated phenotype than what people think. Uh, the first question that a lot of people ask me is why should we study sleep in general? And I think the main reasons are listed on this slide. The first one is there is an opportunity for a major discovery. Indeed, we, we understand circadian rhythm, which regulates sleep, the time uh, at which you feel tired or that you feel more awake, and also that regulates a lot of your hormones with the 24 hours uh, cycle. Uh, but we really don't understand the second part of the equation, which is why when we don't sleep, we feel more and more tired and something happened in your, our brain and then we really need to catch up, which is what we called the homeostatic regulation of sleep. The fact that you can uh, kind of accumulate a sleep debt and, you know, we really don't know the mechanism and, and uh, which is quite amazing for something that everyone experiences. The so second uh, aspect is that sleep problems are extremely common uh, and some of them are listed here, the main ones. Probably there are even more that, that are, you know, not listed. There are more that are not listed here. But one of the most common is sleep apnea, which is when people fall asleep, they relax their upper airway. And very often what happens is they start by, if they have a relatively narrow airway, often in association with obesity, uh, or if you have a small jaw, so then the upper airway becomes a bit too narrow. And when you suck the air in, because the act of breathing is really sucking the air in, creating a vacuum in your chest, then suddenly your upper airway collapses. And sometimes it just gets slightly narrow, but doesn't completely collapse and start to vibrate. That's snoring, which we, a lot of us experience. Uh, and then sometimes it just collapses completely. So typically the patient kind of gasp and what happened is and then, and then you just wake up. And of course, when you have that hundreds of times during the night, it fragments your sleep and it makes you very tired during the day. And also we know that it causes a lot of complication in particular cardiovascular consequences. For example, it's a major risk factor for stroke and for, uh, uh, in particular, high blood pressure. So sleep apnea both makes you tired and also makes you uh, at risk for cardiovascular problem. Another issue that's very common is insomnia, which uh, sleep apnea is more men and often associated with a high BMI, uh, because when you're obese, you put a lot of fat, especially men in this area. Uh, at the opposite, insomnia is more common in women. And to be honest, we don't really know why. And insomnia is a precursor, often a precursor of depression. And I mean, the, the consequences, the health consequences of insomnia are not as clear, except for depression. Uh, we know that insomnia can cause depression, probably, and then depression also causes insomnia. So there is some kind of bilateral relationship. Then there is a whole series of disorders that we don't really understand, where you're, you have a motor disorder. You feel that your legs in the evening are kind of bothering you and you feel that you have to move your leg. It's called restless leg syndrome. It's only in the evening. It's actually very circadian and people just can't fall asleep. They have to just stand up and move their legs. They, and then they go back to bed and they feel they have to move their leg again. And it's also associated with this leg movements during the night where people kick every 30 seconds and it also can disrupt sleep. And then finally, there's a whole group of patients who are tired during the day. Instead of not sleeping at night, their main problem is they fall asleep all the time during the, during the day. And this is the areas of hypersomnia and narcolepsy, and I will talk a little bit about this. And all these complaints, of course, are present also with, in people with autism. So opportunity for major discovery, a lot of sleep problems. And then finally, it's also just in general, sleep is a window to brain function. Uh, what's amazing when you sleep is you get disconnected from all your sensory input and suddenly your brain kind of like reboots like a hard drive and you could say that you just go through specific sleep stages and in a very predictive way 
and it's not contaminated by what you hear, what you, the noise around you. The, you know, you are just like suddenly your brain functions in a, in an automatic way. And then, of course, by looking at how it functions during sleep, it's also a window to how it may misfunction. And I, I don't really have time to discuss this, but there is more and more evidence that, for example, uh, sleep disturbances that are very specific appear before Parkinson's disease, like REM behavior disorder, when you act your dreams during sleep, or prior to Alzheimer's disease, etc. So we think that looking at sleep as far as the sleep waves might be a window to try to understand how brain function works or doesn't work, and potentially even in some uh, cases of autism, for example. Finally, what's really exciting is technology, as was mentioned by John, is completely exploding in this area, especially data. And in fact, sleep is just a lot of data. And now we can really analyze it in ways that were impossible. Um, I like to say that sleep I, is now at the confluence of uh, four different revolution. Uh, one of them I won't talk about because I don't have time is really the neuroscience and animal models. I'm sure you heard that we can do more and more CRISPR and we can modify genes and we can create animal models much more easily uh, and look at their sleep, but it's still pretty cumbersome. But especially uh, in other areas, there is one area which is exploding that was mentioned by John is now we really, it used to be that sensors needs to be, used to be very big, cumbersome, and now they are big, becoming smaller and smaller so that now we can measure EEG with small electrodes and then they can be wireless connected. Then an additional uh, exciting area is that enormous amount of data can be analyzed, uh, especially through deep learning or Bayesian uh, uh, based statistics, which uh, you know, are really making predictions that are more and more accurate and can really also change uh, a lot how this large amount of data that you collect can be analyzed. And then finally, uh, we all know about the genetic revolution. Uh, you know, it's done already. I mean, we can sequence the entire genome uh, of, of thousands of people. Uh, often it's more a matter of power. Uh, and I will talk a little bit about genetics, but I think there's a new revolution that I will talk a little bit about, which is proteomics. Um, for a while, you know, of course, gene produce proteins, and a lot of people have thought if we could measure the proteins, they are also modified by environmental factors that are closer to the physiology. So that would be wonderful. But up to recently, it was impossible to really measure thousands and thousands of proteins. But now it's possible. There is several technology that allows that. And this is really exciting. And I will give you application in the field of sleep. Um, so just for background, as I mentioned, sleep is, is really regulated by two factors. And I want to really insist on that, that sleep is not just a brain. It's the entire physiology. It's you know, everything changes with sleep and circadian rhythm. So the first uh, factor that regulates sleep very strongly is a circadian clock. We all experience jet lag, and it's a result of the fact that the organism has an internal clock inside the brain, inside each of your cell that measures the time of the day and that prepares the organism to confront the challenges of that particular time of the day. And it's organized very precisely so that at certain hours, there is certain release of hormones. You are more awake at certain hours, more sleepy at other hours. And everything is synchronized. This clock is really directed by the brain. There is a very strong clock that's at the level of what's called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, which are in a very small region of the hypothalamus, and they are directly collect, connected to the eyes, so that even so, there is a clock that lasts 24 hours in this circadian uh, rhythm uh, clock in the suprachiasmatic nuclei. In fact, it's re it really doesn't kick exactly at 24 hours, sometimes a little longer, sometimes a little shorter in every individual. But what's interesting is light resynchronizes every day, so that you're absolutely sure that every day you are in sync with the 24 hour cycle. And what's amazing is every uh, cell of your organism is also actually as a clock the same way. And these clocks are all the same. They are pretty much built from a series of specific proteins that have been isolated. And in fact, they were responsible for a Nobel Prize recently, uh, which are called per and uh, clock 
and they basically dimer us together and then they control uh, the other genes that then are produce proteins that go outside and then come back to re inhibit themselves in these loops. But then these loops take 24 hours. And that's why the activity of cells in your body, they all fluctuate every 24 hours with a circadian rhythm. And they are all synchronized by a master clock in the brain that then synchronize at different times all these different clocks so that your liver may be active at certain times of the day, etc. So it's a really amazing uh, machine. And in fact, it's just to point out that about half of the genes uh, in the body are cycling. So it's enormously important. I mean, even drugs, if you take drugs at certain time of the day, they probably have different effects at different times of the day. And yet it's almost not studied at all. And actually the second aspect that controls sleep, which is a sleep debt, is the opposite of circadian rhythm. Circadian rhythm, we know a lot about it. There is the Nobel Prize. We know the, is the proteins that are involved in this cycle of 24 hours. But sleep debt, we don't know what's in the brain is measuring how much sleep you got. But we know that it works together with circadian rhythm to control how awake and asleep you are during the day. And the way it works is actually a little bit counterintuitive. Most people think that the circadian clock will make you awake during the day and make you tired during the night. In fact, that's not the case. The circadian clock makes you awake in the evening and makes you more sleepy in the early morning. And the reason is the following, is when you wake up in the morning, you are rested, you just slept. So you really don't need uh, any extra boost because you just slept, you have zero sleep debt. And as the day progress, normally, you should start to accumulate a sleep debt. You should be further and further away from when you slept, so you should feel more and more tired. And that's not what we experience. In fact, if anything, we experience that we are even more awake in the evening. We have a kind of a second wind. And the reason is in the evening, even so we have been awake for an entire day and we have accumulated a big sleep debt, there is a, the temperature of your body rises and the circadian clock helps you to stay awake in spite of the fact that you have been awake for the entire day. And if, of course, in the middle of the day, there's a little bit of a vulnerability zone where you have been awake for almost half of the day, so you already have a sleep debt, but then your circadian clock has not kicked out the second wind, and that's where you can take a little nap. And the opposite happened during the nap, the, the, the sleep. First, it crashes, and the first part of the sleep that you get is slow wave sleep and you kind of have a, your sleep debt is removed, and then you, you sleep very deeply in non-REM sleep. And then the second part of the, of the night, you're already rested, but the circadian clock decreases your body temperature to make you even more sleepy so that you can continue to sleep in spite of the fact that you're rested already. And that's why a lot of people wake up sometime in the middle of the night because they just have already used their sleep debt but then they have not yet decreased their temperature as a result of the circadian clock. And there's also a little vulnerability zone in the middle of the night that can produce this midnight uh, insomnia. And I want to point out that sleep, the same way as circadian, how tired you are, also regulates everything. That even if you look in the liver, the liver somehow sleeps as well in some ways because if you calculate the number of genes that changes in the liver as a function of your sleep debt, independently of your circadian clock, you also have an enormous number of genes that are changed depending on how tired you are. So these processes are extremely important and they work together to make you awake during the day and asleep during the night. So when we started to look at the sleep field, uh, there is a couple of things I personally realized. One of them is that Sleep is a very heterogeneous discipline. Unfortunately, and that's a curse and also a fantastic opportunity. I can talk to people about autism. I can talk to people about, uh, I don't know, prostate. <laughs> I mean, I can talk about anything and there's always a connection with sleep. In fact, in sleep, what is sometimes difficult is it's almost difficult to know what not to do because there is so much to do that is interacting with every function. So one of the things that I started to look at is how can, and the second problem is people who work in sleep are often coming from very different background. So there is some basic scientists, there is some geneticists, there are some neurologists, there is some psychologists, there is some 
uh, respiratory physiologists because of sleep apnea. So it's, so it's very diverse field. And often they have this field of specialty, but they don't see the whole car. You know, they see only pieces of the car because a good sleep is not having any of this problem, plus having the right amount of sleep debt and the right circuit in time. And so we, we first tried to create a questionnaire. I, I met with a lot of different uh, uh, specialists and we tried to really create a detailed questionnaire that covers all the aspects of sleep not only how tired people are, if they sleep well at night, but also a little bit of their uh, general habits um, uh, in terms of at what times they go to bed, at what times they wake up, et cetera. And also a lot of questions about sleep disorders. Do you snore, you don't snore, do you feel your legs? And then we just created this questionnaire that used mostly branching logic. Uh, so that it kind of, if you have no problem, no sleep problem, which by the way is rare, <laughs> Uh, especially past a certain age, you know, in 10 minutes, you can finish the questionnaire because it asks you, do you feel your legs bother you? If you say no, it moves. But if you say yes, then it's going to ask at what time, how often, etc. And then we use that in our clinic. And every patient at our sleep clinic actually goes through this. And then we have a summary at the end that the clinician can look at and immediately they have a good idea of what kind of sleep problem people have. Because another big problem we have with sleep is often the sleep problems are so common that sometimes there are multiple sleep problems together. For example, it's not uncommon to have a deadly combination of sleep apnea, snoring and gasping, and having insomnia. And this is actually a very bad combination that's difficult to treat. So by having all these different uh, scales, we have an idea when we see the patient what kind of problems they have, and then we are sure that everything has been addressed. The second big problem besides this just ability to see the whole patient across all specialty through subjective symptoms was also to try to better capture sleep itself through the sensors that we use to measure sleep. And this is the problem we have now. As you see, this is what we use. And you can imagine that you can't sleep normally you know, with this. I mean, first, most people have to sleep on their back because they have all kinds of wires everywhere. It looks like it's very comfortable, but that's not the reality. Uh, you don't sleep normally with all this electrode. And, you know, there's clearly a need for hardware improvement. I will talk about this. And, but still, it's very remarkable. When you measure sleep clinically, you measure an incredible number of physiological parameters. As I told you, it's a window to brain and just whole body physiology when the person is really captive because they are not moving and they are going through this automatic programming. And for example, you have all the brain waves that re represent you know, the brain activity. You have the muscle tone, which is very important to measure in the context of, of uh, rapid eye movements or REM sleep, because during REM sleep, you have a very active brain uh, that you measure with EEGs that's very active, but you, have, you are completely paralyzed when you're dreaming. Then you measure the leg movements, because I told you, you know, kicking is very important for restless leg. We measure the eye movements because it's important for REM sleep. And of course, we measure all kinds of aspects of breathing and heart rate because of sleep apnea. And, um, uh, and uh, this way we can have both the sleep cycle, you know, when you fall asleep first, as I told you during the night, initially you don't have a lot of REM sleep. You mostly have slow wave sleep. You catch up your, your uh, non-REM sleep debt. And then towards the second part of the night, you dream a lot more. And as I told you, it's the time where your circuit and clock is driving your temperature low, and then that's when you dream the, the most. And when uh, we do this kind of sleep study, what's amazing is, I, I don't think people realize, but there's about a million studies like this that are done every year in the United States alone. So it's not like a small little market. I mean, it's, there are thousands and thousands of sleep clinics. When I did my, my medical school and my specialty in sleep medicine, my, the number of my specialty certificate was 404. So I'm kind of an old kind of, you know, I was really at the beginning of these things. And my boss, Dr. Dement, who was a graduate student when uh, he just passed away, when REM sleep was discovered, he signed in all the certificate. He was the number one of the sleep specialist. <laughs> So it's a relatively recent uh, specialty. And, uh, but what I want to point out is that all this scoring is done by technicians. 
they go through these pages and pages. Originally, they were pages, but now they're screen by screen. And then they look at the EEG and they say, oh, this looks like stage one, you know, because the pattern of the EEG is just like barely sleeping. And then it's slow wave sleep. There is these big waves. And, and then that's REM sleep because there's the eye movements. And then they look at sleep apnea and they have very clear definition when people stop breathing and the oxygen drops. And then they have very clear definition about leg movements. And all this is done by thousand technicians that just do that very, very uh, uh, slowly. Actually, it takes about one hour and a half per sleep study. And uh, this seemed to be completely absurd to us because this is ideal for machine learning, especially a new a type of machine learning, because machine learning is a very broad term. It can also be glorified statistics, you know, just like, you know, a linear regression or logistic regressions, a little bit more complex, but the same principle. But uh, what I'm talking here is about deep learning. Deep learning really came about through facial recognition. And the way facial recognition uh, was, was uh, developed first was the idea was the following, is uh, you have these systems of little neurons, uh, that's why they're called uh, neuron net, neuronal networks. And these little neurons you know, take a decision, yes or no. It's a relatively uh, basic definition. It's not a probability, it's relatively simple, yes or no. And then they are really represented by little filters. So when you have a picture, you have a picture that goes through this filter and then it will, it will say yes or no for certain feature also the picture. And then on the other side, you train the network uh, by having people recognize my face versus other faces. And little by little, the network is going to recognize all the small little features that are specific to me versus everybody else. And then when a picture will be presented with a similar uh, way of, 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 of uh, analyzing the image, it will deduce that it's me as opposed to someone else. So the machine really learns to recognize my picture. And as you see, it's a little bit like a black box, you know, because you don't really know which feature has been used. And that's something that people sometimes uh, criticize, but act actually now there are new ways to analyze the network to really understand what it's doing, but I'm not going into detail. But what's remarkable is it really can imitate any task of a human, especially a task like uh, facial recognition or a task like speech recognition. And uh, it's working incredibly well. Initially, as a scientist, I hated it because it's against the gut of a scientist to, to think that this stupid network is going to deduce something without any rule or any like beautiful logic, but just by finding little fragments of probability actually it works incredibly well. And one of the big advantage is that it imitates humans exactly the same way humans do it. So actually, even if there is artifact, if for example, there is a blank face, you know, nobody is going to recognize it. It's even if there's no rule, it's going to recognize it's not me if it has not been scored as me. So um, this is the way this what we call convolutional network works. Is, as I mentioned, there is this little filters and it recognizes and it say yes, no, yes, no, and then it takes a decision. But then more recently, this CNN, that's called convolutional network, have been improved into recurrent networks where instead of taking a decision like yes and no at each node, it actually takes a decision depending of what happened just before. And this is ideal, for example, if you had a video it could recognize my face even better by knowing it's already my face as a frame before. But uh, for sleep, it's even more ideal. Sleep, we follow all these uh, this signals all through the night. And of course, when you have stage one, you know that you're going to go in stage two. It, had, it usually has some predictive patterns. And then this allows you to make even better prediction uh, uh, by using the temporal uh, component. So as an example, what we did is we tried to use this kind of deep neural network to automatically classify stage one, stage two, stage three, dreaming, sleep, REM sleep uh, by uh, machine learning. And again, what you, it's very easy because we have all these technicians that look at this 30 seconds epoch and already annotate them as stage one, stage two. So basically you feed this information to a network and the network will recognize the image that you know, is a representation of the data 
of a certain stage and then little by little it will learn very quickly actually to score automatically stage one, stage two, stage three, the way the technician would do it. And in fact, after about 400 or 500 studies, you know, the performance plateaus and it's pretty much learns everything. And it's really very efficient. The second thing, this is a little more complicated. I wanted to just to point out that actually there is a little bit of an art on how you create these networks, you know, but uh, it's really a series of the CNN and, 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 uh, and, and uh, temporal uh, uh, recurrent networks. Now, what's beautiful about this is you can even prove that it can do better than humans. You're going to tell me how is it possible because since it's trying to imitate humans, how can it, you can prove that it's doing better than humans? In fact, you can prove that it can do better than humans by using multiple humans. So for example, this is a sleep study that has been scored by six different scores. And here the white is like being awake and then red is uh, stage one, the beginning of sleep, stage two, and then deep sleep, stage three, and then the black is REM sleep. So it's a typical, typical sleep cycle. You know, you fall asleep, you go into non-REM sleep, and then REM sleep. And as you see, you have more and more REM sleep toward the morning hours. And then you, awake, you wake up sometime in the middle of the night, as I kind of tried to explain to you. Uh, as you see here, for example, this first period of REM sleep, five out of six technicians said it was REM sleep, but one of them did not score it by REM sleep, you know. So, but you see that what's beautiful about machine learning is that it actually gives you not only if it's REM sleep or not REM sleep, it's going to give you a probability of REM sleep. So for example, here, it shows that the probability of REM sleep seems to be about 90%. So it, it, it actually gives you almost like if thousands of scores had scored that study and give you a mean result of all these scores. This is even more striking. It's one single study that has been scored by 4,000 different scores as part of a, like a, a, a training exercise by the American Academy of Sleep Medicine. And then you see that sometimes uh, some technicians thought, oh, maybe it's not stage two, but people are waking up a little bit. And you see that exactly the same thing happened with uh, machine learning. The machine learning not only recognize, you know, stage one, stage two, but it kind of recognize even when the stage is like stage two, but a little more like stage one. So this gave us some interesting ideas, actually. So it's just to tell you that machine learning does not just imitate humans, but can give you completely new insight. Indeed, one of the things we check next is, uh, is it biased by the pathology? If you have sleep apnea, if you have insomnia, if you have leg movement, is, it, is the scoring still the same between humans and the machine? And in fact, we found is that it's very consistent. There is almost no effect. I mean, the p-values are some, some are significant, but it's really negligible, uh, considering the very large sample size. Basically, no difference, except for one particular pathology, where you see that there's an extremely big divergence between the human scoring and the automatic scoring of the machine. So we said, oh, that's very interesting, why? And indeed, when you look, the reason is a normal person that's again, you know, you go into, you're, you're awake and then you fall in stage one, stage two, and then stage three, and then you have REM sleep. You know, it's a classic sleep cycle that I explained. And in narcoleptic, we know that they go straight into REM sleep. It's very abnormal because they dream. But what's really striking about narcoleptics is sometimes they are half awake and half in REM sleep. They may wake up paralyzed, for example, but they are completely awake, like they have the paralysis of REM sleep, or sometimes they dream, but are half awake, and it's very scary, they have this kind of hallucination. And look what the machine learning is doing. It has trouble to dis sometimes differentiate these stages, exactly like the patient describes it. It's like it says, it, there is a probability of 30% of being awake, 30% of being in stage one, 30% to be in REM sleep. This never happens in normal people. So this told us that indeed the sleep of narcoleptics was qualitatively different, you know, that it was just having a different signature. And he actually, we used that with a second model, which more like a lasso, which is like a linear regression. We extracted these probabilities of different sleep stages in patients with narcolepsy versus control. And then we could construct a second model to diagnose narcolepsy automatically from the sleep study. 
normally you have to do a nap test is much more time consuming but using just machine learning on the psg and this probability distribution that are derived from the automatic scoring and these very special features we could actually diagnose narcolepsy better than even the conventional uh, nap tests that we use that ask people to nap during the day and to go into REM sleep. And this has a rock curve, but it's just to show you that machine learning doesn't just imitate humans. It can give you also insight way beyond because sometimes you find these completely abnormal patterns. So by the way, we can do everything else. We can also detect uh, micro arousals, sometimes very difficult to score, but people wake up for uh, two seconds and then we can, we, with machine learning, we have trained the network to actually be able to do that as well, better than humans. And now we can really do everything pretty much that a technician does better or as well as humans. We still have a little bit of problem with sleep apnea, but I don't have time to discuss it. And the, the real reason is not that much as the machine doesn't work, is that the humans are completely disagreement most of the time. So the scoring is so poor that the machine has trouble imitating humans because they don't agree. So why do I do this? I mean, honestly, you will say, okay, it's saving time to do the sleep study, but it's not so exciting, all right? I mean, okay, you're doing it more reliably than humans. You are doing it probably better. You can discover new insight into sleep pathologies. That's one aspect. But my real goal was to apply this in large sample where we'll have also genomic and other information to link, link the genomic with the sleep patterns and try to understand which genetic abnormality change sleep and, and potentially other symptoms. And for this, we started to do this uh, study where we have uh, patients that have these sleep questionnaires that I told you, because at the end, if I find a gene for spindle or for stage one, nobody cares, all right? I mean, it's not like, oh, I find the gene for stage one. But if I find a gene to say that predisposed to uh, a specific disorder or something or complain or being tired the morning or not having your sleep restorative, of course it has value. But what I want is to have the subjective complaint linked with the objective measure, find this as some kind of endophenotype and then link it to the genetic data because as I will explain later, the so genetics is really causal, always causal. And that's one of the power of doing genetics. And for various reasons, we also measure the, the scan of the face uh, and also use actigraphy because for sleep apnea, the face can be predictive. In fact, we, by a, with a scan of the face, we can predict about 80% sleep apnea. It's not, not too bad. And then we also have some cognitive uh, tests to try to link all this with this data. So the next question is now that you have good system to analyze the data, why would you use genetic analysis? So again, I'm completely biased in genetics. I'm just, I'm disclosing my bias. And the reason is that genetics is always causal. And that's why now you have a lot of technology, particularly something called Mendelian randomization that takes advantage of this to try to address causality, almost like when you do a clinical trial. If you have a genetic abnormality that's associated with autism, it has to be causal because it's not autism cannot modify your gene. I mean, there is, a, the, of course, epigenetic, but in general, when you measure the sequence, you know, it, can it cannot happen. So it's always causal. The problem is sometimes the effects can be small, et cetera. We can discuss other aspects that are limitation, but the fact that it's causal is, is really incredibly uh, powerful. And just to give you an example, uh, narcolepsy, which is of course my baby, uh, I had, you know, when you do a genetic study of association, you take thousands of narcoleptics and thousands of control, you find these peaks of genetic association that account for a relatively small risk, but still, when you look at the function of this gene, you realize they are all immunologic. And, and in fact, uh, that has allowed us to dissect the cause of narcolepsy as being an autoimmune disease where really it's triggered by the flu. People get the flu and then they uh, address, they have an immune reaction against the flu that once rarely becomes abnormal. And instead of just recognizing the flu in the context of certain T cell receptor, recognizes a piece of hypocretin or orexin that looks like the flu. And then it makes a cross reactivity 
between these two, the flu and the piece of hypocretin, and it destroys the cells that produce hypocretin, and then you have narcolepsy. So it's just to show you that the genetics tell you that it's autoimmune. And now for me, at, re at least it's very exciting because for a while, and this is the only pharmacology slide I will have, but for a while, a lot of people have tried to, you know, when we discovered the cause of narcolepsy, we discovered that it was the lack of this hypocretin, that molecules that keeps you awake. And a lot of people have developed drugs that helps to sleep better on the basis of blocking hypocretin, really creating narcolepsy, but only for one night. And uh, right now they are just under development and it looks like they're going to be very helpful, especially for people who have abnormal circadian uh, uh, rise of alertness. And it will be a long, I don't have time to talk about it, but it looks like the second wind that I told you is very mediated by hypocretin. So it could be very helpful, for example, for people who have trouble falling asleep before very late or for people who are uh, shift workers. There is a small study that has shown that using this kind of drugs that block hypocretin really helps shift workers to sleep during the daytime, completely uh, at the opposite of the normal cycle. And for me, what's very exciting too is there's even drugs that do the opposite, that wake people up by stimulating hypocretin and replacing hypocretin. And in patients with narcolepsy, it seems to be amazing. I mean, uh, this is a narcoleptic patient. It follows asleep in two, two minutes out of a test of 40 minutes where you ask them to stay awake. In two minutes, they are sleeping. It's impossible. They can't stay awake. They are just so tired. And after these drugs, they are completely normalized. So it's very exciting for me because this kind of drugs are now coming in, in uh, uh, being uh, uh, used for treating narcolepsy. And they could have, a, a, you know, definitely some uh, application in other areas, including autism with sleep disorders. Now, still this big, I'm going to pass this. Uh, there is some analytical challenge to what I told you, and I'm not going to talk about it. One of the analytical challenge is we have a lot of data, a lot of genes, a lot of proteins, and you can imagine that there is a lot of uh, opportunity for false positive. So you have to really power your analysis well, and you also have to do some, what you call dimension reduction. You have to look how your data is correlated so that at the end you don't test everything possible and try to pick up your p-values. Now, um, in terms of genetic, to just come back to the genetic aspect of sleep, uh, right now, unfortunately, very few studies have looked at the EEG part. I showed you that we're trying to do that and we have a few thousand people, maybe 10,000, but it's a relatively small sample size. At the opposite, there is one particular uh, studies that you have all heard of that's so exciting, which was unfortunately, I wish that the United States would have done it, but unfortunately we were not able to, to do that. No other French, by the way, but it's the British that were really smart to do it. It's called the UK Biobanks. They took 500,000 people and they asked them questionnaire and they did a genetic survey, just a simple GWAS. And now they have even more and more that's coming in. They're continuing to characterize but it's a very well-powered sample. And what they found, for example, is if they ask just a question, how early or late you go to bed, you know, they find that indeed the genes that are associated with being an early bird or night owls are all those genes that regulate the circadian clock. And we know that it's logical because the circadian clock, if it runs too slowly, then you always kind of have the tendency of trying to go to bed later and later and if it were, it's too short, a little bit below 24 hours, then you're an early bird. And it's known that, in fact, in fly, you can create early birds or night owl flies just by mutating this gene. So you find that polymorphism around these genes also predispose people to being morning or evening. Now, another big finding, which was really more surprising, actually, is that it looks like as you know, one of the discoveries that was surprising is that bipolar and schizophrenia seem to be relatively similar. I mean, much more similar than people thought uh, genetically, but actually also people who sleep too long, people who complain of needing 10 hours of sleep and so forth, usually they are actually uh, similar genes as schizophrenia and bipolar. I'm not talking about autism, it's much less uh, studied. And then another series of things that was very interesting is people realized that some of the pathologies that we called disorders were probably composite pathologies. 
Like for example, insomnia is very complicated. Definitely anxiety is partially causal to insomnia, uh, but it's not just that, but there is some, definitely some of that. And also more importantly, the people who had restless leg syndromes that I told you, they felt they had to move their leg in the evening. It looks like they have a combination of genes for insomnia and genes for leg movements that kicks. And probably it's a mixed phenotype. It's when you have a lot of these leg movements during the night, for some people that worry about them and also don't sleep well, then it becomes another pathology. So clearly the genetics can also redefine certain disorders. And just that's one example, but we have something that's very, a small study that's very interesting. We, we're studying this very weird disorder, which will illustrate again this idea which is called Klein-Levin syndrome, very rare. People sleep all the time, they are young adult, adolescents, and they sleep for like 10 or uh, uh, 20 hours during the day. And if you wake them up, they're aggressive, uh, they are, they're like in a fog, they're almost confused. The first time they go to the emergency room, uh, they can't add two and two, they're really weird. Sometimes they're also disinhibited. They can eat enormous amount of food. Sometimes they are sexually disinhibited. It's very, it's very severe. It's not just sleeping all the time. And it lasts for about two weeks. And then after that, it disappears completely. And from one day to the next, they're totally normal. And then, unfortunately, it restarts again, maybe a month later, two months later, we have no idea. It's a periodic hypersomnia. And when we did a genetic study, we actually were very surprised because we found a very strong association with a gene that's very strongly associated with bipolar disorder. So, uh, and in addition, we found like, I know that for autism, there's probably some findings that interestingly, there seem to be an association between this trunk one polymorphism and also burst difficulty. So that people who have more burst difficulty also and trunk one, are probably predisposed to Klein-Levin syndrome. And I suspect it's the same in bipolar disorder, that there's an interaction between having a difficult birth and certain genetic factors, such as this trunk one factor. Another example of, of this kind of overlap in phenotype is again, when we, we have started to look at the genetics of periodic leg movements, just the kicks during the night, and you see that it's really much more pure that, uh, in, than, than restless leg. And restless leg definitely seems to be a mix of both, uh, of both insomnia and, and this leg movement. So here we are probably a much more pure phenotype, just looking at the muscle. There's probably a nerve to move your legs that come from your spinal cord and, and, and kicks during the night. And sometime when you're anxious and, and you, you have problem with sleep, then it becomes a restless leg syndrome. So I just want to point out that this UK Biobank is an incredible resource. And that, in fact, we have worked with them and they're going to administer something very similar to the Alliance Sleep Questionnaire. So soon, sleep would be much better phenotype. Right now, they just ask how much, how much time you sleep, if you're insomnia, but it's really not a very good phenotype. Soon, they will ask all kinds of questions at what time you go to bed, at what time you wake up, if you have restless leg, et cetera. The other thing is they have actigraphy available is 250,000 subjects that you can download and analyze. And I think that's a fantastic resource as controls even. And then they are starting to look not only at genetic association, but also at exome sequencing. And this is very powerful because often you find a genome association with a GWAS, you are never sure exactly which gene in the region is involved. Sometimes it's obvious by analyzing QTLs or genetic effects on gene expression, but sometimes it's not obvious at all. But what's nice is if you start to look at rare variants inside the genes, and then you find that when you have rare variants, like in autism, often it's rare variants that cause the same problem uh, as the genetic association, then it's almost the proof that it's really that genes that's causing. And by the way, the apocretin receptor, for example, it really works, you know, they are, which are involved in narcolepsy, they are definitely very involved in regulating some sleep phenotype. I added a couple of slides about autism that I found interesting. So there is this recent GWAS association. And indeed, when you look at the genetic correlation with various uh, aspects of, of uh, physio physiology and mental health, definitely sleep is extremely important. Like tiredness is one of the strongest genetic correlation. 
And I noted also that chronotype is also a very strong correlation. So it suggests that there's definitely some genetic overlap between autism and uh, uh, genetic and, uh, and, and um, uh, some of these uh, uh, sleep phenotype and circadian phenotype. And by the way, I started to look a little bit at specific genes and some of them definitely that have evidence both from GWAS and from single variants or mutation like CADS. I, didn't, I don't know what it does, to be honest, but it seems to be a strong gene candidate for, for regulating both of these type of, of issues. And I, I found others, but, and even more interesting, there is a paper recently, what's very beautiful about uh, genetic studies is, as I mentioned, you can start to address causality. And because you can look at how polymorphism in one group associated with another group that are better or differently associated with different phenotype. And this way, for example, people have shown that insomnia is contributing to causing depression and that depression can cause insomnia. And I, I think it's logical. I mean, you can imagine if you don't sleep at night and something bad happened, then you, you have much more chance of developing depression. But at the opposite, if you're already depressed and you don't sleep well at night, it's even worse. I mean, then you, it's going to make you even more depressed. And you can actually prove this kind of causal relationship through this genetic study, as I told you, this studies of Mendelian randomization. What I found quite interesting is that they seem to show that insomnia or poor sleep in general seem to be causing autism, or at least contributing to the symptom of autism. Uh, so they were a causality pathway, which means that if you treat sleep problems in autism, you're going to improve autism. Um, I mean, I'm not saying that it's causing all of autism, but that's a direction of, of the causality. And it was the same for bipolar, but they didn't see uh, evidence for, uh, uh, for other uh, mental disorders. So the last portion of my talk, at least two, I don't know how much more time do I have because I just want to make sure I'm not, okay, I still have 10 minutes. Okay, sorry, that's okay. So the problem of the genes and that people complain a lot about is you can't do anything about them. I, and I, I, I think it's a fair critic. And in addition, uh, CRISPR is not going to come tomorrow to edit your brain, I can tell you that. Uh, and the second thing is that often they are very small effects. So they are more like learn post. If that's a, a critic that people say, is often they are more like, not in autism because they are more single gene, but often in genetic association, they contribute a small portion of the risk. But really, that doesn't really matter because what they show you is more like, the, it's like putting a, long, a torch light on one particular gene that gives you an idea of what's going on in the physiology of these disorders. But the gene, what do they do? They do proteins. And these proteins are really the things that makes your body tick. And what's really interesting is these proteins are often modified both by environment and by genes. So, but often it's the proteins that are really the interesting things we want to modify or the metabolites. I will give you an example. We know for quite a while that if you have high cholesterol, you know, if you have a certain polymorphism in the enzymes that produce cholesterol are associated with high cholesterol. And we know that high cholesterol is associated with more heart attack and all kinds of problems. But we also know that if you eat a lot of fat food, it's going to contribute to high cholesterol. So the genotype, the modification of the, of the synthesis of cholesterol is not so important as a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. It's much more the fat you eat, but it still prove that it's actually the bad cholesterol that's causing it because of the genetic association. So the power of the genetic association is to demonstrate the causality. So for that reason, we started to get interested in trying to measure proteins, large number of proteins, in relation to different uh, sleep issues. And of course, this is a very big rising field. And I want to point out one thing about proteins. Protein is a little bit like fusion. You know, people have told you about, oh, tomorrow we'll measure all the proteins and it's going. I've heard that for 20 years and I was thinking I will never see it happen because they have been promised, you know, so many times that I didn't believe it. But actually there's some new technologies that make it possible now. 
And for example, there's one particular technique that I, we use that use Aptamer, and I'm not going to go in detail, but you can actually now measure 5,500 proteins with 100 microliter of blood. And it then you change completely your opinion about how you do analysis. You don't look at the proteins that cause autism or that cause something. Often you look at the combination of proteins that together can predict a disorder. And a little bit the same as machine learning, you try to create this multivariate construct that are going to predict certain physiology. For example, with even 1,000, that was an older uh, you know, type of, of platform with 1,300 protein, we could predict age of people. So you cannot hide, you know, even with plastic surgery, you know, we can just predict your age within three years. Actually, now we have, it's more like three years here, it's five years, but from age, you know, five to 70. And uh, that's a mean error. I mean, it's quite remarkable. It's just one blood sample. Uh, and again, uh, this, that doesn't mean that it's causal. Again, it just means that so these proteins may be caused by older age, the change in the protein. Some of them probably cause being older, but many, many are probably the result of being older. But of course, if you find genes in some of these proteins that are associated with living longer, then it might start to be a causality pathway. And I'm not going to go into age, but of course we wanted to apply that for circadian biology. Because a big problem we have about circadian biology is nobody knows how to measure your internal clock. We know that the internal clock that I told you makes you awake in the evening and, and sleepy in the early morning. Sometimes it's completely desynchronized. Of course, if you have a shift worker, it's a big problem. But even in normal people, Sometimes they cannot fall asleep before very late because their clock is very shifted towards late hours or they go to bed too early and there was a problem. Or even sometimes we have people, they don't sleep well at night and they sleep during the day. And we don't even know if it's a circadian problem or a sleep debt problem. So to try to address this, we did this kind of uh, protocol which is called constant routine. So you, you keep people completely awake all the time on a bed and they eat every two hours. So you are sure that if the protein change, it's not due to the fact that they were sleeping. So it's not sleep specific, it's time of the day specific. And also uh, it's not due to meal because they're eating this meal all the time. It's not due to movement, etc. And then also you can do to address the problem of sleep debt, you can also do a sleep deprivation experiments. But uh, when you do that, we actually found that out of 5,000 protein, there's about like 400 that are extremely strongly circadian. And by the way, they, they make sense. Like for example, we know that cortisol is very well known to be very circadian and always secreted in the morning. Whether or not you slept, you have a peak of cortisol in the early morning. It prepares you for the stress of the day, I don't know. But clearly that's a very circadian uh, hormone. And indeed, we found that ACTH and, and the precursor of, of cortisol really peaks exactly at that time. And you know, that second part of the, the person had been awake all the time. So you see that the wave is still present whether or not you sleep. And, but what's wonderful is because we have 340 different proteins, some of them peak at different times of the circadian clock. So you can imagine that you can take one blood sample at any time and then it can give you the, your clock time. And right now, in fact, it's the way we do it, it's very complicated to measure circadian clock. We use what's called uh, dim light onset melatonin. You have to put people in the dark from, from uh, 3 p.m. to uh, you know, 11 p.m. and you take melatonin, you measure melatonin, the saliva, and you see when it increases in dim light. I mean, it's very cumbersome, whereas with this test, uh, we could actually demonstrate that we can predict the circadian time clock of people within one hour, you know, by just one blood sample taking, taken at any time during the day. So, you know, I could take your now or tomorrow and I will know if you're an early bird, a night owl, or if your circadian clock is completely messed up. Similarly, we are starting to find a panel of proteins that can predict how well you have slept. <laughs> I know it's quite amazing, but maybe we'll have a, a test for sleep deprivation, basically. And, and so again, that's going to really change how we interpret our patients. 
maybe we'll understand people are tired because they didn't sleep well, they need something to sleep deeper or because their circadian clock is desynchronized. Uh, we also are starting to find proteins that correlate with sleep apnea and hypoxia and so forth. So our goal is really to link that to the genetic eventually and to find the ones that are causal. And then this way, see if we have a protein in the blood that is causal and correlated, we might be able to find a drug that would modify that protein and be really something that could help the process. Finally, the last few slides that I have is about the last revolution is, as you all know, we are all trying to also measure sleep in a much more convenient way than these crazy ways that I showed you. Uh, machine learning definitely solves the problem of data analysis, but if we could have something super comfortable, it would be fantastic. The problem is you all hear about Fitbit, blah, blah, BB, you know, we have hundreds of those devices and they are supposed to measure sleep, but they don't. What they really do is they measure usually activity. And activity is a good proxy of sleep, of course. I mean, when you sleep, you don't move. The problem is in human, you cannot move and be awake. You know, that's very common. You read a book very carefully, you know, you're not going to move, you will look like asleep. So these are really inactivity detector. And they work great if you have great sleep, if you shut off your light and sleep immediately and, you know, but they don't work, you know, in 20% of the time. Actually with very uh, complex machine learning and high uh, resolution uh, actigraphy, we can predict sleep stages with about 80% accuracy, but, but it's in normal people. I'm sure it really completely breaks down if you have people with sleep abnormality. Another uh, areas where, I, so we try to think about sensors that could be very easy to place and could give us a lot of information. We think sound is very easy and you can detect snoring and breathing and sleep apnea quite well. And eventually, I mean, we honestly, right now with the technologies that exist, you should be able to recapitulate what you need to measure, uh, you know, sleep with a relatively simple uh, set of measure. Uh, for ex there are, but we are not yet there. For example, right now, there are some ambulatory PSGs that you can do at home, but as you see, they are still not very comfortable. And I know some people like Russo Ara that probably you know has work on autism. You really have to train the kids to really tolerate it. Um, but I think the future might be more something like this dream uh, headbands where it's, it's very comfortable. You just wear it and you can measure, uh, it measures sleep, at least the EEG. And, uh, and uh, in fact, we've done some study with the effect of confinement that I'm not going to talk about. And in my, in my opinion, if you mix up a couple of those, like if you use a dream headband and some sensors that allows to measure cardiovascular issues and activity, probably you can get most of what you need uh, to recapitulate a sleep study. And this would, we, we would need to discuss it. Uh, it's very difficult. I've told, told to John right now, it, it's moving so fast that it's almost like it's feasible technologically, but you are at a time where you wonder if you should not do it yourself. And I, I would have a very clear idea of what to do in terms of hardware or just wait until someone else does it. But we are very close to having the ability to measuring sleep, even with existing devices, you know, very well in very large number of people for a large amount of time. And then finally, if we do that, we might be able to even automatically change sleep uh, at home. You could imagine that the program will automatically study your sleep and tell you your sleep is abnormal and then tell you to change your circadian clock, expose yourself to light, do something about it to improve it. And uh, definitely it, it, it's possible we are going to go in that direction. So to summarize, I think what I'm hoping is at some point we will be able to, to understand, especially the molecular basis, especially of sleep debt. We understand circadian rhythm, but sleep debt, what, what is really making us tired? I think that would be really wonderful. I hope we'll have blood biomarker, maybe saliva blood biomarker of some of those uh, processes. Uh, we need automatic non-human based analysis of sleep and actigraphy signals and we need better, uh, a new device that can be used at, at home. Uh, and finally, we will need some basic research at the end to understand it. 
but clearly we have to move sleep outside of being a specialized field to people who do autism and do other area and, and to, to really crack this, this, uh, uh, this area. So thank you for joining me and joining us. And this is a slide, the final slide, and I'm open for questions. Thank you. Thank you.